Hey, it's Mazzy, and, and today I play the entire catalog of this Los Angeles band. And when I get in the mood of something, I get inspired. Uh, I run downstairs and I, I turn on the camera and want to record a video for the channel here. So uh, welcome back, Mazzy here. I want to talk about a band that is a very influential band, famous for a moment, literally two plus, maybe two and a half albums, third album that um, was sort of patched together, and I'll get into that in a minute. But I want to talk about Buffalo Springfield. The Buffalo Springfield. I mean, in a way, everything out of Los Angeles in the rock world really came out of the birds in terms of the modern 60s rock world. Of course, there were bands before that. There were the Beach Boys. There was, you know, Phil Spector doing his thing and, you know, a lot of other groups, the whole wrecking crew and everything. But in terms of uh, bands that really, uh, to me, encapsulated Los Angeles in a way for a very short time was this hybrid of an American and Canadian band in Buffalo Springfield. And I played all three of their albums, plus uh, this uh, post graduate album that came out after a sort of a, a best of hybrid. Uh, there is a best of that they put out. I don't have here that I'm going to show you, uh, but I suggest anyone uh, into Buffalo Springfield at the very least, I uh, get the greatest hits and that is not an expensive record, but let's start out in the, at the end of 1966. And apparently the story goes, Steve Stills and Neil Young ran into each other driving by on uh, Hollywood or Sunset Boulevard back and uh, they started this band. Now, this copy is <laughs> pieced together, taped together. This was from my buddy Coleman's collection and this is a mono uh, pressing. Now, this is the second pressing. So I'll get into that a little bit of mono and stereo. This was at a uh, time, again, this came out December 1966. In my mind, this was always an early 1967 record, maybe because that's why um, or when I got the, uh, the vinyl version of the, of the album, because this album was recorded and released, and uh, there was a song that... Steve Stills wrote at the end of the year and recorded at Columbia Studios and put out as a single, and that was For What It's Worth. And that was their first top 10 hit that climbed the chart. It was a song written about the riots on Sunset Boulevard, and it became, as we know, an anthem for a generation. Hey, kids, what's that sound? Everyone knows what's going around. There's a man with a gun over there. You know the song. I don't have to botch it for you. But um, on subsequent pressings, it was added uh, to this and opens up uh, the second pressing of this. This is the second pressing because it has for what it's worth. But someone <laughs> did a whole tape job on this copy. But I'll, I'll, let me just get to the stereo version. I actually quite like this album in stereo. I think it works. This was a, a point where the mix was really good. And as much as I talk about the music stupid and, you know, I do like good sounding records. And sometimes I've been all in on stereo over mono in, in some cases, like Sgt. Pepper even. I prefer the stereo, Who, what do I know? Uh, but that's what I first got and that's what I enjoy. And um, this record with Dewey Martin on drums, Steve Stills, the second lead guitar, which is which is uh, an irony there, uh, Neil Young lead guitar, Richie Fure rhythm guitar, and Bruce Palmer on uh, on the bass, and that was the original Buffalo Springfield. Uh, this record was recorded, I believe, in the summer of 1966, again, released in December of 66. Didn't do a whole lot. I think it only hit number 80 on the charts, and that's not very high in the 1960s, considering how influential uh, For What It's Worth was, and that was everywhere. You couldn't get away in 1967 hearing that song. It was, again along with uh, Jefferson Airplane, The Doors, Sgt. Pepper, one of the songs, maybe if not albums, but songs of uh, 1967, and re really represented sort of the, the, the um, you know, the counter younger generation, especially in Los Angeles. Now, um, there's a whole lineage of uh, these members. In a way, they were a super group before they became super in so many ways. But the songs on here, for what it's worth, okay, okay, you got, to me, the golden voice here, someone who really kind of didn't, um, you know, connect too much after that uh, with the with the 
audience on a commercial level is Richie Fure. Richie Fure had the purest voice in Buffalo Springfield. Now, purest voice, as we know, doesn't mean great and that you want to listen to it all the time. Just think of uh, Americans Got Talent with all those friggin' a game show vocalist thing where people have the perfect pitch and the vibrato and they're great, but they have no soul to them. Now, F Richie Fure is a great songwriter and a great um, singer here. But you got this song here uh, written by Steve Stills called Go and Say Goodbye, which is Richie Fure and Stephen Stills singing together. And you could really start hearing, knowing what we know later with Stephen Stills with Crosby, Stills and Nash and his solo records, you really hear that throaty side of him. And we know that he was one of the greatest uh, musicians of this band and beyond. Of course, on the first Crowd of Souls and Ash album, he was the one that played like 80% of the parts on that. As much as I love Neil Young, and I definitely love Neil Young, I think Steve Still is technically the better lead guitar player. However, it's not always about technical things in rock and roll. Nowadays, Clancy can even sing, uh, written by Neil Young, and but it's really Richie's singing with Steve and Neil. And that's the thing. I think Neil, on this first album, only sings one or two lead songs. He has the voice that people didn't quite understand, especially people at Atco Atlantic Records. They didn't really see him as a great vocalist, but we all know, look who survived out of all these uh, band members beyond and, and, and just... That to this day, people are talking about him and buying his record. Everybody's wrong. Burned. Burned was one of the few Neil Young, or maybe the only Neil Young uh, led singing on this. Great song. Great rocker on that. Uh, Out of My Mind, Neil and uh, Richie. That's where Neil, Richie, and Steve uh, sing together. But um, it's such a beautiful song. So Neil Young was a great songwriter, and he really wouldn't come on... Uh, in his, his own like realization in music uh, till maybe the second album here to me, which is brilliant. And I'd say aside from that, uh, the second album, Buffalo Sp Springfield, again, is like, to me, a perfect record. And it really, really crosses that kind of early country-ish feel, folky feel into Baroque and psychedelic rock a little bit. A beautiful record. Now, I have several copies here only because this is a UK copy I picked up along the way somewhere. And I need to show this on a personal level because this is my original copy. And this copy, this is from 1967, but I realized I didn't get this album until 1972. Where was I? I'm not sure. But I won't read this all the way to you, but... My girlfriend at the time, Judy, the one who wrote on the first Butcher cover she gave me for my 19th birthday, wrote on this. And let me just read the beginning to Norm. Okay, I hate Norm, but anyway. 12-16-1972, uh, December 1972. Congratulations on your 400th album. And then she writes something very personal. Love, Judy. This is my 400th album. I got. She gave it to me in 1972. So this is, you know, sentimental. <laughs> Someone's going to freeze that and, and read it. This is very sentimental to me, but I love this record. Now, let's go through this a little bit. Um, they have all these influences and inspirations on here in the liner notes. Everybody from Fred Neal to the Dillards to Frank Zappa to the Stones uh, to Burt Jansch to the Ventures to Randy Bachman, Ricky Nelson, Hank Williams, Otis Redding, Doc Watson, Felix Papalardi, Vanilla Fudge, Judy Collins, John Coltrane, uh, on and on and on, uh, Jefferson Airplane, uh, Jerry Yester. Where are the Beatles? Aren't the Beatles here? Anyway, uh, but the songs on here, first we got, let me get another copy. I can read it better because Judy wrote all over it, that one. So we got Mr. Soul, that great, great song that um, they dedicate to the Whiskey A Go Go. They were one of the house bands. Remember, during the whole whiskey time, it, the, the Birds played the Sunset Strip, uh, Buffalo Springfield would play the Strip, uh, the Doors would play the Sunset Strip, and all those clubs. And um, this is a wonderful song, uh, Mr. Soul. Uh, love that song. Expecting to Fly is where Neil Young really kind of breaks out and does something that's very reminiscent to what would be on his first solo album. Very ethereal, classical, 
uh, moody, uh, baroque pop psychedelic. What a, a beautiful piece that is. And then, of course, it ends with Bluebird. Uh, this song, oh, Engineer, is by Bruce Botnick, who would work on the Doors albums uh, the following year. But this is 1967, so this is right in that pocket there. This is their second album. Um, but all these beautiful songs, Rock and Roll uh, Woman, Hung Upside Down, really great harmonies. And again, Richie Fure comes in, but he's not as prominent on this one. Neil Young kind of steps it up a little bit, but it's still, I think, a beautiful album. And, and it's a it's a group, it seemingly is a group effort. And I'm not going to get into all history that I don't know about, but it's a seemingly a group effort. I just love the feel of this entire album. And to close it out, um, after Rock and Roll Woman, the end uh, bit is a six minute, uh, literally mini masterpiece, like an epic. And that's Broken Arrow, a, a several part song, uh, pop prog, not even uh, proto prog, not prog in terms of time change and everything, but this beautiful suite uh, of a song by Neil Young, Broken Arrow, um, engineered by Jim Messina, which uh, I'll mention him in a little bit too, but um, Buffalo Springfield again, a perfect follow-up and really, I think, probably a better record all around. Although all three of their albums, even though the third one is patched together, are really good. And at the end, I'm going to show a Rhino box set that came out some years ago. I think I was on Record Store Day. That is, if you don't have these records, they're hard to get, you know, in decent condition these days. Um, seek out that box set. But last time around, this is the record that was pieced together mostly by Jim Messina, who was brought on as an engineer producer. Uh, you know him later because he produced uh, what was going to be this Kenny Loggins solo project, and he was so into it and played on it and sang on it, it became the genesis for Loggins and Messina. So all these artists kind of really morphed into something else. Uh, last time around was uh, Jim Messina and Richie Fure piecing these things together, these songs from a year before, parts and pieces, making up a final album, which was issued after the band broke up. They owed one more record to Atco Records, and this is uh, the results of what they owed to Atco Records. This wasn't all the members sitting in the studio recording uh, songs to put out as a final. I love the cover art, of the Unipack. I, some people hate these Unipack things, but I love this. Dewey Palmer wasn't really a part of it by this point, as I believe, but you got... Um, Aside, you got um, Neil Young here, and you got uh, uh, there's Jim Messina added in there. They're patched together, really a patching job in in so many ways. But there's beautiful songs on here, and some of the songs would become staples for the artists as they moved on. So, there's a Steve Stills song called "Question." It would become a, a staple of Crosby, Stills and Nash's and Young's a touring project. It was put together on Deja Vu, part of that album as well. I Am a Child, the Neil Young song, he would do forever, uh, you know, on tour and play that song. That would stay in his repertoire for so long. Kind Woman, a beautiful Richie Fure song. And of course, he would go on uh, to, uh, with Jim Messina, is it Jim Messina? Start, yes, yeah, st start Poco, the band Poco. Originally called Pogo, but because of the comic strip, they had to uh, change the name to Poco and became one of the first-ish um, country rock bands that never quite made it uh, on their records. But Good Feeling to Know is one of my favorite. Deliverin' is one of my favorite. They're a lot, they did a fantastic live record, 69 or 70, that came out, which you should seek out. Really amazing single disc uh, live record. But Poco, Good Feeling to Know on Epic Records, Columbia Records, is fantastic. They wouldn't hit it until when I worked at ABC later on, uh, the horse on the cover, that one with uh, kind of the M.O.R. of feeling a love ballad uh, became a huge, huge, a huge hit legend, that album. And as much as I like that, that and Cimarron, um, was it Road to Cimarron, Cimarron? Those records on ABC are really beautiful. Uh, there's a series of records they did at ABC, but they never quite you know, realize the potential. Of course, we know the Eagles became huge and Poco kind of like, you know, went like that. But uh, Richie Fure was a part of it for a long time. Jim Messina, you know, jumped off the boat early, especially when Lagos Messina uh, caught on. And we know Neil Young, where he went, did a solo album, 
beautiful debut, which is a little more Baroque pop than what the later things are. And then he would, uh, you know, form a group behind him to play with him that became Crazy Horse as well. And of course, Steve Stills with Crosby, Stills and Nash. But um, I'd say Carefree Country Day is the lone track on here written by Jim Messina, sung by Jim Messina. It's probably the weakest track. It's okay. It's something like if you got, you know, Paul McCartney uh, to write a song for Buffalo Springfield when he was doing his kind of, uh, you know, when I'm 64, your mother should know type period. Not that it's like that, but it's one of those retro kitschy things on here. It's probably the weakest track in terms of where they were uh, at 1968 when this came out. I believe that was uh, 68. But again, um, Buffalo Springfield, third time around, last time around, but it is their third album and final album. There was a single greatest hits, but a record that I remember really uh, enjoying that came out um, a couple years later in the early 70s was this double record. Uh, this is Buffalo Springfield, Neil Young, Stephen Stills, Richie Ferre, Jim Messina, Bruce Palmer, Dewey Martin. Uh, I guess Bruce Palmer is the one who left, not Dewey Martin. I'm, mis I'm forgetting it, okay? So uh, this record is fantastic because it's somewhat of a hit, but it's it's a hits record like um, Louder Than Bombs is on the Smiths or uh, No One Gets Out Alive, the Doors double record, where it is hits, alternate versions, a few kind of rarities in a way. And it just really works wonderfully as a double album. So I would say, you know, I would get those all their entire catalog. But if you just find this in the wild, uh, check this out because... You obviously have the singles like For What It's Worth, Sit Down, I Think I Love You, which um, is a Stephen Still song that was a hit uh, for the, um, the Mojo Men. Uh, Nowadays, Clancy Can't Even Sing, Pay the Price, which is a great Stephen Still song, Burned, Out of My Mind, Love, Out of My Mind, that Neil Young song. Again, there's different versions. There's a really long nine-minute version on here of, um, of Bluebird, and Bluebird has the banjo on that uh second album this has this long jammy kind of ranting uh we call, we used to call it the um the donkey sound of Stephen still he's going oh yeah oh yeah for like several minutes during the nine minute uh, version long version it's kind of like a jam but it's it 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 was really exciting at the time when this came out to hear that version because we weren't getting a lot of alternate type of of songs I realized in the late 60s into the 70s there weren't albums that came on a hits record came out of course there was a separate Buffalo Springfield greatest hits but when a hits record came out you didn't get alternate versions and they didn't really at that time yet yet throw in a single to make you buy the whole album again but this was kind of a fun thing like that with some alternate versions um four days gone by Stephen Stills as well so uh this um, side four Bruce by Jim Messina. This was came out in 1973, and this is Buffalo Springfield. And in closing, as I kind of hinted to uh, earlier on, if you don't have any Buffalo Springfield, and I don't know the availability or the price, but this came out for Record Store Day some years ago, uh, Rhino. I bought this back then. This is fantastic because, first of all, these are cut by... Chris Bellman, so that they sound exquisite. There's an insert going over uh, each album. And it basically is only the three albums, but the first two are mono and stereo. So you get beautiful heavy stock cover of the mono version. And this is the original version without, for what it's worth. And this is a mono, beautiful, beautiful heavy jacket and it sounds amazing these are what these are what i played uh over the last uh day uh, that got me into playing everything i just played all these through because i just didn't want to hear any clicks and pops and my records are in good condition still but i wanted to hear these and they sound fantastic now that could be you know bringing up the whole discussion about artist intent they actually sound fuller than the originals but i digress there the original in stereo, and this one adds the for what it's worth uh, to begin uh, the record with. You have the mono version of again, and um, there you go. 
And then, of course, you've got the stereo version of, again. And then you've got just a nice, beautiful uh, pressing of, of uh, last time around. This only came out in stereo. There was no mono of this in 1968. Same kind of cover. Beautifully put together and this lovely box. So if you don't have uh, any albums, I would say seek this out. Musically, it's 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 music that holds up. And if you're fans of, you know, Crosby, Sills and Nash or, and Neil Young and Poco and, um, well, just that, that sort of birds, post-birds, the next generation of the birds, as the birds kind of floundered, uh, Buffalo Springfield was there. But again, they're, they're one of those bands that are more famous because of one song, even though they had Mr. Soul and Bluebird, for what it's worth, this iconic song that's in every movie about the 60s, than anything else. And I don't think they should be forgotten. And I think there's actually um, those new uh, Double 45, Atlantic 75, I believe they're doing, is it this album? Uh, you're going to know, and I can look it up, but um, they're doing one of those. I'm not going to get it because these sound great. I don't need double 45 to split it up. And I have uh, several copies, as you know. So Buffalo Springfield, to me, uh, one of the best groups out of Los Angeles in the 1960s, along with The Doors and Love and The Birds and The Beach Boys. And um, who else? There's probably others, but I'm not thinking right now. Anyway, thanks for watching. Mazzy loves you.